now I would go to the second speaker, which is uh, Tony Gia. Thank you. Okay, please, you can start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for um, giving me the opportunity to attend this meeting and present. It's my first time attending the meeting. And it's been very interesting so far. So thank you very much. Um, so my name is Tony Ja. I'm a researcher at ELSI, the Earth Life Science Institute uh, at Tokyo Institute of Technology, and also a, an affiliate of Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. And today I'm going to be presenting one of the systems that I work with that um, we're trying to recreate for um, some types of primitive compartment systems in the lab. So I hope uh, you enjoy this uh, presentation. Um, a little bit about my background. So I did my undergraduate degree at Caltech. Um, I actually studied protein expression and crystallography, and then I studied um, lipids. And then I moved to Harvard, where I studied mostly RNA uh, sequencing and also polymerization and um, kind of RNA world related topics. And so studying these different biomolecules, lipids, nucleic acids, proteins, it really got me to think, you know, how exactly did these biomolecules emerge and evolve in the first place? And that led me to my current position at LC, where I've been since 2017. And I've been studying many topics related to origin of life and astrobiology related to chemistry, bi biology, and other various topics. So the modern cell is very complex. Uh, many researchers have been studying it for many years, and while we've learned a lot about how it works in the last 10, 20, 30 years, there's still a lot left to be explored. And one of the unanswered questions of the modern cell is how exactly did it emerge and evolve in the first place? And one of the hypotheses is that before the emergence of the modern cell, a more simplistic cell emerged uh, or was um, uh, existed and some people call this the protocell, which is simply a primitive compartment which contains some type of material inside surrounded by some type of boundary. The material could be genetic or catalytic, the boundary could be a lipid layer or some other type of boundary. And so one of the goals of origins of life research um, is not necessarily to create some living cell or living protocell within the lab, but to understand how, for example, life emerged starting from the far left prebiotic chemistry, how these reactions could assemble into a primitive compartment or a protocell, and how this protocell type compartment could have evolved into a modern cell. So these are kind of the, the steps that one may, may take to try to understand questions related to the origin of life or the origin of the cell. In particular, when um, examining this question, one of the crucial elements that uh, many researchers have found is that compartments are crucial to origins of life. And this is because uh, compartments actually give many specific functions that can promote the emergence and evolution of a protocell or a cell-like structure, including, for example, catalysis, um, protecting molecules from degradation, preventing diffusion of genetic or other materials. And so compartments are specifically very crucial to origins of life. Uh, one mechanism to create a compartment is through a process called liquid-lipid phase separation. So for those of you who may not be familiar with this topic, uh, it's a process which results in a um, kind of a soft condensed phase, which forms droplets that contain no membrane. Uh, these droplets can be formed from simple molecules, as I'll show shortly. And also they allow exchange of molecules between phases as well. Um, from within the droplet to outside of the droplet and into another droplet, for example. So such phase separation actually is very prominent in biology. So there's actually many membraneless organelles in uh, our modern cells, and they provide various functions, including gene regulation or repair. And some of these include um, uh, stress granules, new granules, or even it's been proposed that um, chromatin is a phase separated structure. So it's not like phase separation is um, a process that is not very present in biology. It actually is. And so this leads to the question of perhaps phase separation being a mechanism on early earth to create such um, compartments. Generally, there are two types of phase separation. So there's non-associative and associative. In the left side, non-associative, what generally happens is two types of polymers 
are mixed together and for uh, various reasons such as differences in polarity differences in um, affinity they actually don't associate and this results in formation of membraneless droplets which are um, concentrated in one specific polymer and the outside solution is concentrated in the other specific polymer the other type is associative on the right which results from um, generally combining two um, polymers or molecules that have a strong affinity with each other these molecules form together and these form uh, droplets that are um, concentrated in both of these components um, there can be two or more components but for um, the sake of simplicity in this in, in this talk let's assume that there would be two components in this system so one example of a non-associative um, phase separated system are is an aqueous two-phase system from a polyethylene polyethylene glycol and a dextran um, polymers when they're mixed at specific ratios the dextran and peg the polyethylene glycol actually separates uh, due to uh, i believe differences in um, polarity and um, this results in a formation of a dextran droplet within a peg um, kind of bulk phase uh, the other type associative can be formed through um, binding of, for example, oppositely charged biopolymers. For example, in this case, a positively charged peptide, polylysine, and a negatively charged nucleic acid, DNA, RNA, which contains negative charges on its phosphate backbones. So coacervates or complex coacervates in this case are an interesting model system that uh, many have started to um, study in the context of a primitive compartment. And one of the reasons is because these coacervates can actually uh, contribute some very relevant functions for a primitive compartment system. For example, it's been shown that coacervates can segregate and concentrate biomolecules and other biomolecules, uh, biomolecules and other types of molecules, you know, 10, 100,000, 10,000 fold. These include nucleotides, RNA ligamers, and uh, divalent cations, for example. Coacervates have also been shown to grow and divide through external forces, including shear forces, mixing, um, uh, agitation, and also in this case, application of an electric field. And there has also been um, instances shown where coacervates can be des designed with not just a single compartment, but as two separate compartments as shown here. For example, one of the compartment, the compartments may have different affinities for chemicals that could segregate into the droplets. And finally, other researchers have actually shown that coacervates have been able to scaffold membrane assembly, in this case, uh, fatty acids. And one of the plausible or one of the possible scenarios is that membraneless droplets or coacervates could have um, existed before the emergence of a membrane bound uh, vesicle structure, membrane bound protocell structure. And so this is one mechanism by which perhaps a membraneless structure could have gained a membrane. And so these demonstrations show that coacervates uh, provide such functions. And also there are ways to increase the structural complexity of a coacervate. In particular, we're interested in taking this coacervate system and um, adding some some aspects in order to further increase the structural complexity and so in this case uh, with the um, in collaboration with uh, one of the research with a researcher from actually also ESPCI uh, Tommaso Fraccia we actually determined to try to study or try to assemble coacervates with DNA liquid crystals within these coacervates and it's uh, I'm very glad to have followed Nathaniel's talk because um, you know I think many of us here now uh, have a, a bit of an idea about what the importance of um, DNA molecular assemblies um, look like and so in this case a little bit about DNA liquid crystals so you may, might have heard of liquid crystals um, some of these can be found in screens and generally a DNA liquid crystal is formed when a short DNA oligomer forms a duplex shown here. This duplex stacks end to end and it forms these long stiff rods which then bundle together and we can actually see these bundles on a, a polarization microscope due to the um, 
the uh, supramolecular chirality that comes from these bundles. In this case, we studied the uh, a DNA, which is a duplex 12-mer that's palindromic and self-complementary, and we subjected it to polylysine, long polylysine, um, polydispersed polylysine, uh, an average of 240 residues. And so then we determined to uh, see whether there are conditions where liquid crystals and the coacervate droplets could co-assemble. And indeed, we did find some conditions where we could see co-assembly between the uh, peptide nucleic acid coacervate droplet and the DNA liquid crystal structure as shown here. The top is a, an optical microscope image, the bottom is a polarization microscope image. And we believe that, of course, that the DNA liquid crystal structure is from the end-to-end -end stacking of these short DNA duplexes, duplex um, rods. And what's interesting is we then tried to um, determine what environmental conditions would have been required for the assembly of these DNA liquid crystal coacervates, as we call it. And it was determined that there's a very narrow range of sodium chloride concentration that was necessary for these liquid crystal and uh, liquid crystal coacervates to assemble. In particular, at lower salt concentrations, we saw the formation of precipitates. At higher salt concentrations, we see, first of all, the formation of droplets without the liquid crystal character and then further uh, increases in salinity results in disassembly of the structure um, entirely. And we believe that, for example, the structures, the coacervate structure is partially determined by electrostatic interaction between the peptide, the polylysine, and the DNA. And so at lower salt concentrations, perhaps this binding interaction is stronger resulting in the precipitate um, formation. So we also wanted to see whether um, this end-to-end -end stacking interaction of the DNA duplexes actually is the determinant of the liquid crystal structure formation. So we did the same experiment, but with a different DNA sequence, this time with a two-base T overhang so that the DNA rods could no longer stack upon each other uh, tightly. And in principle, uh, no DNA liquid crystal structure uh, formation would have been allowed. And so as expected, we see that um, throughout a various concentrations of salts that only we only were able to see the coacervate structures, the membraneless droplet structures without the liquid crystal co-localization. And this suggests again that the end-to-end -end stacking interaction of the DNA duplexes is essential for the liquid crystal formation. We next wanted to study another um, aspect and how these liquid crystal coacervates reacted to changes in environmental conditions. And of course, on early earth, one of the um, processes that many believe could have been relevant for various chemical reactions is dehydration or drying. And so we subjected a mixed solution of the DNA and the peptide. And in this case, we selected um, conditions which resulted in a precipitate forming and we subjected this to dehydration over you know, a few hours. And so we see over time that um, the structures actually start as a precipitate structure and transition to a liquid crystal coacervate structure. I'll play the video again, it's, it's quite fast. And then eventually to a coacervate structure without liquid crystals and finally in a disassembled state. And so it appears that dehydration of a precipitate state of these um, peptides and DNA mixtures results in transition from the precipitate to a liquid crystal coacervate and then to a coacervate and then disassembly, very similar to what was seen upon changes in salt concentrations. And we believe that this is partially because um, the dehydration process results in up concentration of the salts already in the solution, resulting in um, pushing the structures through all of the available phases that we see before. Here, here's the video again for those who might not have caught it the first couple times. And then the next process we wanted to study was the reaction of these structures to heat. And so start, we started at 20 degrees with a precipitate structure and slowly heated the structures up to first 50 degrees and then to 60 degrees. And at 60 degrees, it appeared that there was a transition from 
these precipitate-like structures to the co-localized liquid crystal coacervate structure. And further increases to 70 degrees resulted in disassembly of the liquid crystal structure, but still it maintained the structure of the coacervate droplet, suggesting that perhaps the stacking interaction melts or disassociates at a lower temperature than the interaction between the peptides and the DNA required for the droplet formation. Next, we then actually recooled these structures. And so at 40 degrees, we noticed the reformation of liquid crystals within these coacervate structures. And what's interesting is that, of course, not all of the coacervate structures reassembled their liquid crystal states at the same time, but we also saw a couple different types of liquid crystal structures. Um, one is the cholesteric phase and star, another is a columnar phase. Um, see you. Don't worry about the um, details about this. Just know that there are two different um, liquid crystal structures that we saw. And upon further decreases in the temperature, we resulted in the um, observation of the columnar phase liquid crystal co-localizing with these droplets at um, low temperatures. And if we compare this to the initial state at 20 degrees, it appears that some type of a transition has occurred in the structure simply affected by um, a heating and cooling cycle or a, you know, an annealing cycle. And perhaps this is because um, it's possible that the liquid crystal coacerate form is more thermodynamically stable than the, um, the uh, precipitate form. And so some type of heating and cooling is required for this state to be reached. Um, and when we heated and cooled the various um, liquid crystal structures at the different salt concentrations, we see actually the formation of a few different types of uh, columnar structures as well. So at very low salt, the precipitates after heating and cooling still remain in precipitate form. And at higher salt concentrations, the liquid crystal coacervates and the, um, the non-liquid crystal coacervates still retain their forms, but at intermediate concentrations, it appears that the precipitates actually then take the form of columnar style um, crystals co-localized with droplet forms. And so we believe this is one of these very um, uh, interesting um, uh, processes, one of the more interesting processes that we observed. And not only do the structures uh, take on these forms and, you know, they can be uh, modulated through changes in heat or salinity. We also measured the amount of DNA within and outside of these droplets. And in the various liquid crystal coacervate or regular coacervate structures, we see that the um, concentration of DNA inside the um, droplets shown here is sometimes two to three orders of magnitude greater than the DNA outside of the droplets, suggesting that um, these droplets could have been one way to concentrate DNA, um, whether prebiotically in a prebiotic environment or not. So it could concentrate DNA, perhaps um, allowing for faster chemical reactions or the, the pushing of certain chemical reactions, which wouldn't have been possible in a dilute solution. And putting all of these um, studies together, uh, so here we see that um, there's the different phases in the liquid crystal um, structures, the columnar phase, the cholesteric phase, isotropic phase is just this uh, normal coacervate structure and uniphase is a disassembled state. And we see that through these two axes, changes in temperature on the y-axis or salt on the x-axis results in transition of these crystal, uh, liquid crystal coacervates through the entire known um, kind of mesophase regions of um, this, this graph. And so simply by changing uh, salt concentration or um, temperature, we may be able to uh, change the structure of these liquid crystals um, coacervates. Of course, we only tested sodium chloride and we're currently in the process of testing other salts as well. Um, there may be some differences depending on the salts. Um, and one of the kind of larger goals is perhaps to uh, try to study uh, some type of um, droplet evolution, for example, finding droplets or finding sequences which have more propensity to form liquid crystals. Um, and perhaps these liquid crystals could um, imbue some type of um, function to these coacervate droplets. What that would be is still not exactly clear, but um, it has been shown that liquid crystal structures 
can help to control um, regional selectivity of reactions or perhaps even drive electrochemical reactions. So some of these uh, processes in combination with these membraneless droplets will be looked into um, in the future. And so just a little summary of the structure, the internal structure, upon increasing heat and salinity, we see these liquid crystal coacervate structures change. So first at lowest heat and salinity, these columnar liquid crystals form through um, the, so here the DNA is in blue and the peptides are in red. And so what uh, the internal structure apparently is um, these DNA rods stacking uh, on each other to form long stiff rods that bundle in a hexagonal pattern. These bundles of rods interact with the peptide chains to form this um, very tight columnar liquid crystal phase. Upon increases in heat and salinity, we see first these bundles of DNA rods start to come to get up, um, a little apart. So this is the end star, the cholesteric phase. And then further increases in heat and salinity result in the um, stacked duplexes of DNA coming apart as well, resulting in the isotropic or non-liquid crystal coacervate phase. And finally, at sufficient heat and salinity, the DNA and peptides no longer interact, um, you know, electrostatically or any other way. And this results in full disassembly of um, the system and we see no droplets whatsoever. So if you're interested in some of the more experimental details uh, regarding the system, please uh, feel free to take a look at, of course, the, the preceding, the um, extended ab abstract, but also these other papers, which was published which were published last year um, for a sense of the experimental um, procedures. And uh, other than the liquid crystal coacervates, we're also interested in studying other primitive um, droplets. I won't get into very big detail here, but one of the systems we like to study are polyester micro droplets, which, which can be assembled through simple drying and rehydration of a, an alpha hydroxy acid monomer library. And these droplets are also membraneless they can um, form spontaneously and can um, segregate various dyes or RNA or protein as well. And we've also shown the ability for these droplets to incorporate charged um, moieties as well to further increase the um, compositional complexity. And so if you're interested in some of these studies, these have been uh, published over the last few years and I encourage you to look at these papers whenever you get a chance as well. So I'd like to take this time to give a big thanks to all of those who helped to make this um, project happen. First of all, um, my main collaborator for this project, Tommaso Fraccia, who is at um, IPGG in Paris at ESPCI. Uh, and we were actually able to work together before COVID hit. Um, I was able to receive a travel grant from the French embassy in Japan to do a collaborative visit in Tomazo's lab. And that's where we did a lot of the work shown here today. Uh, some of my other funding sources that supported this are from Tokyo Institute of Technology, uh, JSPS, um, and uh, Japan Astrobiology Center, and also uh, IANA Travel Grant, the European Astrobiology um, Network Association. And for the polyester work, I'd like to thank um, some of my other collaborators who some of you here might know, Irina, Jim, and Kuhan. It's been a pleasure to work with um, each of them as well on the polyester work. And again, I'd like to thank my other um, collaborators or those others who have um, contributed to this and other projects at uh, my own institute, ELSI, my university, Tokyo Institute of Technology, and my other collaborators um, and you know colleagues around the world who have contributed to anything uh, related to this or any of the other number of projects that we've been working on together. Uh, for those of you who are uh, unfamiliar, ELSI is a research center in Tokyo funded by the WPI initiative, a world premier international research center initiative of the um, Japanese government. And it's a very interdisciplinary institute with you know, geologists, planetary scientists, biologists, chemists, and some of the uh, researchers who you may know who are also studying um, you know, machine learning, artificial life, um, complex systems like topics. and. The goals of this institute are to study the origin and evolution of planets, Earth, and life on Earth. And I hope that at some point after um, the pandemic is over, or maybe it'll never be over, but at some point when it becomes safe that you can come, come and visit us and uh, we'd be glad to have you. So thank you very much for your time and attention. 
I'd like to thank the organizers again for giving me this opportunity and I'm happy to take any questions. For those who don't have an opportunity to answer a question here, please feel free to contact me by email anytime as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for this uh, fascinating presentation. And uh, uh, now it's time for some questions. Actually, we have five minutes to discuss some details about this study. Uh, I see a couple of questions in the chat. Ah, there is Jitka. Uh, just, I would like to say thank you for, for your interesting presentation. I'm sorry, I focused also on other things. So I will uh, watch it uh, later again. And for sure, I will contact you because this is also closer to our research. And especially I have seen some pictures from Polaris microscope and we will need to discuss something as well. But now I don't want to open the discussion because maybe you said it in talk and I was not focused properly. And also thank you for introducing LC. And I have very nice memories to my stay in Japan. So thank you for showing me again you, your LC Institute. Yeah. yeah. And now the other can have the question related to your talk. Yeah. Thank you. OK, thank you, Jitka, for this comment. I also have to add that ESSI is a quite unique uh, institute, almost uh, unique in the world, where there are uh, really a multidisciplinary research. I also was there to visit my friend uh, Yutetsu Kuruma some years ago. OK, so I see some questions in the chat. Uh, one of these is the following. Can liquid crystals be observed in any complex conservate systems? Hi, thanks for that question. So um, in this case, we only tested one coacervate system, but I think that as long as the DNA structure can um, assemble into the rod-like states, it could be possible to observe in other coacervate systems as well. For example, we're interested in seeing whether the DNA liquid crystal structures can um, be retained within, for example, polyester droplets as well. So. I believe that the limiting factor is definitely the ability for these DNA, um, you know, rods to to stack on top of each other. Okay, so this was a question uh, by let me see by Rudraup, and then, then there is another question by Natal. Can you make different types of bundles? What would happen in a system where they are in competition? I mean, rods, not bundles. Could you make different okay, types of rods? Okay, thanks for this question. So I think you're referring to, for example, if we had two or more different types of rod um, DNAs forming these rods or perhaps rods of slightly different architectures. And I think the answer is yes. Um, there's actually been studies shown, first of all, where um, the DNA liquid crystal structure need not be composed of one type of DNA sequence. Um, one of Tomazo's old uh, studies showed that you can actually make them from very high concentrations of nucleotides as well. And so um, what is really um, necessary, again, is, is the formation of these rods. If these um, nucleotides are not at sufficient concentration, these rods really can't form. And so I think it'd be interesting to see if it'd be possible to um, have some type of competing liquid crystal structures, for example, one at, at the same temperature, one type of crystal structure that forms like um, the columnar phase, another type of crystal structure that forms the cholesteric phase and see how these can compete or even exchange um, information or exchange um, the, the components with each other. And there's also studies where these rods can actually change through chemical processes. Um, in particular, Tomazo's previous work showed that polymerization of the rods um, when they're already formed results in changes in the structure as well. And so uh, through polymerization, one can induce um, the formation of these rods um, and um, the, the formation of these liquid crystal structures. So there's a lot of uh, interesting things that can be done with this or similar types of systems if it's not exactly the system. Okay, thank you. I have also a question about the thermodynamics of these uh, liquid structures, liquid crystals. Do you know, you know, in order to form these liquid crystals, you need to have interaction between the rods and also interaction between the different pieces of the rod. <clears throat> um, is there anything uh, known about uh, the forces or the energies between of these two type of interaction? What is stronger, 
let's say, is, yeah. uh, or there is a, a kind of cooperativity, you know, if the formation of the bundle also help the formation of roads, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure exactly. Um, I don't have a good answer for that right now. But what I can say is based on the, um, let me find the, the slide here, based on what we saw from increasing the um, temperatures, we believe that because the um, bundles are um, disassembled at lower temperatures than the rods, we believe that it's likely that the rods are more the, the interaction is a bit stronger than the bundle formation. But um, these this cartoon is, it, it's a cartoon. These structures haven't been subjected to, for example, x-ray scattering experiments, which would actually show the internal structure. And hopefully we can do that at some point to, to really um, kind of show what's inside. And that would give more insights into your question and other um, aspects of the system as well. Mm -hmm. And then it's also fascinating that you can get the liquid crystals by cooling down a hot system. Whereas if you form from the beginning, you don't get uh, liquid crystals. So it is like uh, the system uh, must assemble according to a certain path, not to um, every, it's not, not everything is possible you know, at the beginning. Mm. So how would you um, comment on this? Um, perhaps we can view this as a kind of a thermodynamic landscape with different uh, wells of different depths. Perhaps at the starting point, we've reached a well which is not at the lowest depth, and we need some type of energy input or some type of change in the experimental or the environmental control, uh, conditions to have this um, structure leave this kind of middle well, which is maybe like a kinetic trap type of well, and then access the more deeper well. So perhaps this is one way to uh, visualize or, or imagine how this, this process could have occurred. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tony. It was a pleasure to have, um, have you here.